Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our service tonight. And if I've not seen you yet today, happy Easter to you. Great to have you with us as we gather together uh, this evening. In our service tonight, we're going to be in Mark's Gospel once again. We're into chapter 16 now as we've been working our way through Mark's Gospel for some time. Uh, We're coming to the first few verses there of chapter 16 uh, later on in our service. Uh, Then in the week ahead, we have our prayer gathering here at half past seven on Wednesday evening. Next Sunday, uh, the morning service is at half past eleven and the evening service at six o'clock. And I shall be taking both of those uh, services. Some of the other ministries that would normally meet during the week uh, are not taking place this week due to the Easter holidays. Uh, But we still have the the prayer gathering and the services next Sunday as usual. And then just to mention a few things in May once again, uh, the church dinner. There is a sign-up sheet for that now in the foyer. Uh, Please do add your name to that if you're able uh, to come along that evening, Saturday the 6th of May. Uh, Do just indicate on the sheet if there are any particular dietary requirements uh, for that. Uh, Then on uh, the following Saturday, which is the 13th of May, we're hosting the Presbytery Day Conference here. You can sign up for that online on the EPC website. And then uh, the weekend after that, the 19th to the 21st of May, is our church weekend away down in Castle Wellen. And again, you'll find booking forms for that uh, on the desk as you head out uh, this evening. Well, this evening we gather to worship God and in particular and especially today to remember the fact that Christ is risen from the dead and I'm going to read some verses here from Revelation chapter 1 this glorious vision of the risen and ascended Christ John writes then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. It's this risen and ascended and glorified Christ that we gather this evening to worship. And our first item of praise is Psalm 16. If you could turn there or watch on the screen behind me, Psalm 16. And we'll sing from verse 7 through to the end of this psalm. And of course, the reason we've chosen this psalm for this evening's service is that this is one of the great Old Testament prophecies concerning uh, the resurrection of the Christ. In particular, uh, the words of verse 10 uh, are words which speak of the resurrection of Jesus. For you will not allow my soul in death to stay nor will you leave your Holy One to see the tombs decay. This psalm written by David, but of course, as the New Testament tells us, it cannot be about David because his body is still in the grave. Uh, But this psalm was fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Holy One, when he rose on the first Easter morning. So we'll stand and sing together Psalm 16, starting from verse 7 and through to the end of the psalm. Let's stand and sing. Oh 
Please be seated. Let's come to God now in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again we can gather together this evening as your people and bring our worship to you. And we come to you in the name of your Son and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank you for what we read of him in those verses of Revelation that we heard earlier on as our call to worship tonight. That Jesus is the first and the last and the living one. He's the one who died and is now alive forevermore and who holds the keys of death. And we praise you that for our salvation, that he lived a perfect life and then suffered the death of the cross, bearing all of our sin, giving his life as a guilt offering, pouring out his soul to death, and then having died, rose again and ascended to heaven where he now is seated at your right hand interceding for us as our sympathetic high priest. We thank you that in Christ you've provided the saviour that we need, the one we need to save us from sin and from death and from hell. And we pray that in his name you would have mercy upon us, O God, according to your unfailing love, and according to your great compassion, would you blot out all of our transgressions, wash away all of our iniquity, cleanse us from all of our sin. Because against you and you only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Father, we pray that you would wash us, that we may be whiter than snow. For a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Restore us to fellowship with you, that we may walk in the full assurance of your promises and in the freedom of knowing that you care for us and have brought us to yourself by the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that this evening, as we gather to worship you, that the spirit of the risen Christ would be present amongst us and that he would be active to bless us as we sing your praises as we lift our prayers to you and as we hear your word read and preached comfort our hearts we pray with the news of the resurrection this evening because we ask all of these things in the strong and precious name of your son and our savior jesus christ amen let's hear these words now from romans chapter 8 as our words of encouragement uh, this evening. I uh, read these words this morning as well, but it's worth referring to them again, assuring us that because Christ has died and risen again, there is no condemnation for us, and no one can bring any charge against us as God's people. Paul says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Well, we're going to sing together now of the, the blessings that are ours as a result of Christ's death and resurrection for us. It's hymn number 557. Peace, perfect peace, in this dark world of sin, the blood of Jesus whispers peace within. Hymn 557, we shall stand and sing together.
seated. I'm going to turn to God's Word now. If you have a Bible there, please could you turn with me to Mark chapter 16 as we begin our reading this evening at verse 1. Mark chapter 16 and from verse 1. Mark writes these words. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is God's word, and we thank him for it and pray that God will add his blessing as we hear his word preached this evening. Well, let's come to God in prayer now with our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession as we reflect on these verses from Mark chapter 16. Let's pray together. Father, we've just sung a few moments ago of the peace, the perfect peace that Jesus has won for us by his blood, through his resurrection, and in his sovereign reign over all things. Father, we thank you that as we stand before you this evening, that we do so, as it were, not on our own two feet, but in Christ. Lord, if it was simply down to us none could stand before you but we thank you that we stand before you in christ and in him and thanks to what he has done we know that we are forgiven of everything and we are counted righteous in your sight father we thank you that through the cross that we have the forgiveness of all of our sins and death has been defeated and life with you forever is ours in our savior And Father, even and especially when we are troubled by doubts, troubled by concerns, troubled by all the different things that strew our paths in this life, may we be assured that Christ is risen for our justification and even now he is interceding for us. He is on the throne of heaven. Even as we've sung a few moments ago, peace, perfect peace, our future all unknown, 
Yet Jesus we know, and he is on the throne. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you that the risen Christ is now on the throne of heaven, at your right hand, and interceding for us. So we praise you and thank you for that peace that is ours in him. And Father, we pray that as a church, you would help us and equip us and enable us to take the good news of Jesus and share it with those around us. Father, one thing that the, the resurrection appearances of Christ tell us is that Jesus wants the news to be told to the world, told to the disciples, told to his friends, told in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. And Father, we thank you that we have a part to play in that great work of making Christ known. Lord, we pray for our ministry in, in this vicinity as through the various different ministries of the church, the good news of Jesus is shared. And as individually through our own lives and our own friendships, we have the opportunity to speak of Christ to others. Lord, equip us for that, we pray. And we pray that you would use us for your glory. May we see the Spirit himself taking these words that we speak of Christ and in his sovereign grace, applying them to the hearts of those who hear so that irresistibly they come to the Saviour and have new life in him, come to trust in him, turning from their sin and clinging to him as their Saviour. Father, we praise you that that is the grace that is ours in Christ. And may many others likewise come to receive it as well. And Father, as we consider the resurrection of Jesus, would we be assured that all of your promises to us are true? Father, you promised in the Old Testament that the Christ would suffer and die and rise again. And then Christ himself promised that time and time again as he ministered to his disciples that the Christ would suffer and on the third day be raised from the dead. And we thank you that in the resurrection we see that your promises are true. Father, when we're going through difficult times in life, when we're facing opposition, when we're facing adversity, when all is not as we would like it to be in this life, and perhaps we're tempted to doubt your providence. May the news of the resurrection assure us that all of your good purposes are coming together in Christ. And all of your promises are yes in him. Father, we thank you that this evening we're able to gather both morning and evening and hear the news of the resurrection from the pages of scripture. This morning from the prophecy of Isaiah. And this evening from the account of Mark. And we pray that as we hear your word, would, you spirit, would your spirit drive these things into our hearts, that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that he died for sinners and rose again. And may we trust in him for all things, for life and for eternity. So, Father, do your work amongst us, we pray, because we ask it all in Jesus' name and for your glory's sake. Amen. Well, let's sing together once again as we prepare to turn to that passage from Mark chapter 16. We're going to sing hymn number 223. Christ is risen, hallelujah. Risen, our victorious head. Sing his praises, hallelujah. Christ is risen from the dead. We'll stand and sing.
Please take a seat. Let's pray together now. Father, we do thank you so much for the truths of which we have just sung, that Christ is risen from the dead. And as we turn to your word now and hear the story of how that happened, would you help me as I speak and help us all as we listen, that we might be convinced of the truth of these things and understand the implications of them for all of those who trust in the Saviour, in whose precious name we ask these things. Amen. Well, please do have your uh, Bible open there at Mark chapter 16 this evening. It is almost exactly two years to the day since we first began our series of sermons looking at Mark's Gospel. This is sermon number 67 in the series, uh, for those of you who are counting. And with absolutely no planning on my part, but entirely in the providence of God, we just so happen to arrive at chapter 16 of Mark's Gospel uh, here on Easter Sunday. I do love it when a plan comes together. And having looked previously at the events of Good Friday, we uh, have looked at how Jesus was put to death on the cross and then placed in the tomb. And we come this evening to Mark's account of what happened early on the Sunday morning, which of course we know as Easter Day, the first Easter Day. And Mark points us once again in his narrative to these three particular women. Uh, first of all, there's Mary Magdalene. The woman from whom Jesus had earlier cast out seven demons. And then there's another Mary, though we're not entirely sure who this Mary is. Mark has already told us earlier on that she is the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph. Though apart from that, we cannot be entirely sure who she was. And then there is a third woman, Salome, who is the mother of James and John. And you remember that these three women were all there at the cross. They were all looking on as Jesus died. Mark commented back in chapter 15 that when Jesus had been ministering in previous years up in Galilee in the north, in the early part of his public ministry, that these women and others also had followed Jesus and ministered to him. And they've travelled south with him now. They've come to Jerusalem. And even at the cross, when most of the twelve had fled the scene, still these faithful women were there. And furthermore, the two Marys had also been to the tomb on the Friday night. They had seen where the body of Jesus was laid. Now the Sabbath day began at six o'clock on the Friday evening and it ended at six o'clock on the Saturday evening at which point the shops in Jerusalem would have opened again and at that point on the Saturday evening this group of faithful women had gone to the shops they had bought certain spices with which to anoint the body of Jesus as a, a sign of respect for the deceased in the custom of their day so they went and they bought these spices, but by then it was too late to then go to the tomb and anoint the body of Jesus that evening. And so what do these three women do? Well, they agree together. We'll get up very early tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, and we will go to the tomb together. 
and we will anoint the body of Jesus then. And as they made their way there, Mark tells us that these three women were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Remember, two of them, the two Marys, have already been there once already on the Friday evening. They went there with Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They'd seen it all. They, they knew exactly which tomb Jesus was in. They'd also seen that there was a large stone that had been rolled against the entrance of the tomb. Maybe on the Friday evening it was Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and perhaps others also who had rolled this stone into place. But these three women know this is not something they're going to be able to do themselves. And perhaps they were hoping that those Roman soldiers standing guard at the tomb might help them. They're talking about this as they make their way to the, to the tomb. And Mark records for us then that they are met with a series of three surprises of increasing intensity that morning. Three surprises that they find. The first is this, that the stone has already been rolled away from the tomb. Mark tells us, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. Still early in the morning, very early in the morning, but clearly someone has been there before them. And they don't know who it is, but in Matthew's Gospel we're told what had happened. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. These women didn't see that happen. They just see that the stone has been rolled away, their first surprise that morning. And then going into the tomb to investigate this, they meet their second surprise. And that is that there is an angel there. We're told, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Typical of Mark, that we're given only a very, very brief, to the point, description of what took place. But the other gospel writers include more details of what this figure looked like. Matthew says that his countenance was like lightning. His clothing was as white as snow. Luke describes his shining garments. This is an angelic being who is before them. And the women, understandably, are alarmed at this. Their second surprise, the angel that they meet in the tomb. And yet the third surprise that they meet this morning is the greatest of them all. Because the third surprise is the news of the resurrection of Jesus. And we'll look at these words of the angel in more detail later on. But I want us here simply to note what he announces to these three women. And he says to them, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, he has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. The angel announces to these women the news of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The one who, with their own eyes, they had seen being crucified on the Friday morning, dying on the Friday afternoon and being buried on the Friday evening, was no longer dead on the Sunday morning. He has been raised from the dead. And this empty tomb in which they now stand is the evidence of it. And what I want us to do in our remaining time this evening is to look in detail at what else this angel says around that glorious announcement of the resurrection. And we'll notice that these words of the angel indicate four implications of the resurrection. For these women, for the disciples, and for us as well, four implications of the resurrection. And so here's the first of them. We're going to notice this from the words of the angel. The resurrection of Jesus gives us peace. The resurrection of Jesus gives us peace. 
And we see that, don't we, from the first words that the angel speaks there in verse 6. Back in verse 5, we've just read that these women, upon having seen this angelic being before them in the tomb, are alarmed. And the angel clearly senses that because his first words to them are, do not be alarmed. This announcement of the resurrection is good news and it ought to drive away their fears. It ought to give them peace. And as you read the other gospel accounts of the resurrection appearances of Jesus, one thing you notice is how often people are instructed in the presence of the risen Saviour not to be alarmed, not to be afraid, but to have peace. You see that in all of the the four Gospels, but especially you see it in John's Gospel. Listen to these words from John chapter 20, the resurrection appearances of Jesus. In verse 19, we read this. "On On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And then two verses later on, we read this. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. And then in the very next passage, just a few verses later on, we read this. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Happens time and time again. The risen Jesus and his messengers announced the news of the resurrection with greetings of peace. Do not be alarmed. Do not be afraid. And you might ask, well, why does the resurrection of Jesus give us peace? There are many reasons that we can count. The, the hymn we sang earlier on lists many of them, many of the reasons for peace, perfect peace, thanks to what Jesus has done. Let's consider just a a couple of them. Firstly, the resurrection assures us that our sin has been paid for. It assures us that our sin has been paid for. Because on the Friday, Jesus had hung on the cross as a condemned man. And he was bearing the sins of his people, giving his life as a guilt offering, dying in the place of sinners. But how do we know that the sacrifice that he made was sufficient to pay for all of our sins so that there's nothing left for us to pay? How do we know that we'll not arrive at the gates of heaven and be turned away because all of our sin has not been paid for? And we know that because Jesus is risen from the dead. The resurrection is the divine vindication of the work of Christ, showing us that If we're in Christ, all of our sin is paid for through the cross and we are reconciled to God and there's no condemnation for us. The resurrection assures us that we are justified. He was raised for our justification, Paul says in Romans 4. And therefore we are at peace with God. And as well as that, the resurrection assures us that death has been defeated. Death is a terrible enemy. We naturally recoil from it. Nothing can fill us with fear and with anxiety like death can. And yet the resurrection shows us that death has been defeated. And it has been defeated through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And therefore eternal life is ours if we're trusting in him. Yes, we still have to die. But as Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And so we can say with the Apostle Paul, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The resurrection of Jesus gives us peace. And I wonder, do you know what it is to have peace, real peace, in your heart? Maybe that's something that feels elusive to you. Your heart is restless. You just can't seem to find real peace. Peace is elusive. 
This week, of course, marks the anniversary, the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. And yet we know all too well, don't we, that the, the level of peace that we enjoy in this country is fragile, far from perfect. And the peace that the world offers is always like that, isn't it? Fragile, imperfect, often elusive. Where do you find real peace? You find it in the risen Jesus who by his death and his resurrection has dealt with the problem of sin, dealt with the problem of death, has reconciled his people to God and has secured for his people forgiveness and eternal life with him. Peace, perfect peace. In this dark world of sin, the blood of Jesus whispers peace within. Peace, perfect peace. Death shadowing us and ours. Jesus has vanquished death and all its powers. The resurrection of Jesus gives us peace. And then secondly, the resurrection of Jesus fuels our proclamation. Fuels our proclamation. Look at what the angel says there at the start of verse 7. But go, tell his disciples... The news of the resurrection is not something to keep to yourself. This is news to go and share. And in God's providence, the first human heralds of the news of the resurrection would be this little group of faithful women whose job it would be to go and tell the disciples that Jesus was risen from the dead. And as many have pointed out, this was a, a surprising aspect of the story because in that culture women were not even able to be called upon as witnesses in a court of law and yet in God's providence it was these women who are the first witnesses of the resurrection and of course it's not just their job to share the news of the resurrection as well as that it is the commission that the church as a whole has received from the risen Jesus to go into the world and to proclaim that Jesus died and Jesus rose again. Listen to these words of Jesus from Luke 24. This is after the resurrection and he's speaking to the twelve and he says to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And that's our job as well, isn't it? The resurrection of Jesus fuels our proclamation. We live in a world that is desperately lacking in hope, desperately lacking in meaning, desperately lacking in purpose. And the world around us looks for hope and meaning and purpose in all sorts of futile things and none of it works it just leaves them feeling empty and lost without hope for life or for eternity and in the resurrection of Jesus we have the best news in the world to share with them in the resurrection of Jesus there is true hope true meaning true purpose true life and the risen Jesus says to his church, go and tell the whole world that I died and rose again. And that through turning from their sin and trusting in me, they can abound in hope and be filled with peace. Without the fact of the resurrection, we would have nothing of any value to offer the world. As the Apostle Paul says, if the resurrection did not happen... Our preaching would be in vain. And of all people, we would be most to be pitied. And the resurrection makes all the difference, doesn't it? I wonder, who can you tell about the resurrection of Jesus and all that it means? Who can you simply invite along to church so that they can find out more? Who can you give a Christian book to so that they can read for themselves what the Christian message is all about the resurrection of Jesus fuels our proclamation and then the third thing that we're going to notice is this that the resurrection of Jesus guarantees our pardon guarantees our pardon 
And I wonder if you notice that little detail that the angel includes in the middle of verse 7. He says, But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Why those two little words, and Peter? Why does the angel in particular specify that the risen Jesus will meet with Peter as well as with the rest of the disciples up in Galilee? Well, of course, he was alluding to what had happened already very early on the Friday morning. Peter, having already boldly claimed a few hours beforehand that even if he should have to die, that he would never deny Jesus. He then crumbled pathetically at the questioning of a a young servant girl. Three times he denied being a follower of Christ. He denied even knowing Jesus. It was Peter's worst failure. And in the immediate aftermath of that failure, he was devastated. We told that he went out and wept. Well, he might. You can imagine what Peter must have been thinking, can't you? Surely Jesus is finished with me. After failing him so very badly, having fallen so easily, so badly, so painfully, and repeatedly, surely Jesus will want nothing more to do with me. And that's why the angel includes these two gracious words in what he says to the women that morning. Go and tell his disciples and Peter that the risen Jesus is going before you to Galilee. Now, of course, it was a gracious thing that Jesus would meet up again with any of his disciples since they'd all failed him, every one of them, deserted him in his time of greatest need. And yet it was Peter, more than the rest of them, who had failed so abysmally that night in his threefold denial. And you know, I'm sure, what would then happen up in Galilee later on when the risen Jesus met with the disciples and Peter. Three times Jesus would ask Peter to reaffirm his love for Jesus. And as it were, Jesus is wiping away each of Peter's three denials. He's covering them over. He's forgiving them. He's restoring Peter to renewed fellowship with Christ. And ask yourself this, what did the resurrection mean for Peter? Guaranteed his pardon. That's what it meant for him. Guaranteed his pardon. The risen Jesus assured him that he was indeed forgiven for all of his sin, shameful though it was. It had all been dealt with at the cross. And there was a future for Peter, serving his Lord, making him known. Let me ask you this. Do you feel that you have failed Jesus too badly to be given another chance? You look at your life, you look at your heart that no one else sees, and you think to yourself, I've fallen into sin too often and too badly and too easily and too painfully. How can I be a Christian? How can Jesus want anything to do with someone like me? Do you feel a bit like the Apostle Peter did between the Friday and the Sunday morning? And here you see is the good news that the resurrection of Jesus placards for us. That all of our sin is dealt with. And Jesus will not fail to forgive any one of their sins if they come to him trustingly and repentantly. And even now the risen Jesus is in heaven He's at the right hand of God. He's interceding for you, just as he prayed for Peter. Have you fallen badly? Come to the risen Jesus for forgiveness, and you will be forgiven. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees our pardon. And then there's one final thing that I want us to see from the words of this angel. And that is that the resurrection of Jesus confirms his promises. 
confirms his promises. And we'll notice that from the final words that the angel speaks in this passage. He says this, There, that is up in Galilee, you will see him just as he told you. Just as he told you. Now, of course, there were numerous times throughout the public ministry of Jesus when he had predicted not only the fact of his death, but also the fact of his resurrection. So, for example, in chapter 8, we're told that Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. Jesus had promised numerous times he would rise from the dead. But what the angel is referring to here in particular is what Jesus had said to his disciples back in chapter 14. Just after they had celebrated the Passover meal together on the Thursday evening, Jesus had then taken his disciples over to the Mount of Olives. And before going into the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus had spoken to his disciples and he, he said these words to them, you will all fall away for it is written i will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered but after i am raised up i will go before you to galilee and you see here in chapter 16 the angel picks up on those words of jesus from chapter 14 and he confirms again that that promise that jesus had made back in chapter 14 would come true he would rise from the dead and he would meet his disciples in Galilee there you will see him just as he told you and you see don't you the resurrection of Jesus confirms his promise and it's not just that particular promise that the resurrection of Jesus confirms for us the resurrection of Jesus confirms every promise of God's word to us. The promise of forgiveness for our sins confirmed in the resurrection of Jesus. The promise of eternal life for those who trust in Jesus confirmed in the resurrection of Jesus. The promise that one day there will be a day of final judgment confirmed in the resurrection of Jesus. The promise that sin and death and hell are all defeated. Confirmed in the resurrection of Jesus. The promise of an everlasting kingdom. Confirmed in the resurrection of Jesus. And the promise of a restored new creation. Set free from all of the effects of sin and the curse. Confirmed in the resurrection of Jesus. And I wonder, do you struggle at times to take God at his word and to believe all of the promises of God that we find within the pages of the scriptures? And you read the promises of God in his word and you think, surely this is too good to be true. Will these things really come to pass? And this is where you look to see the cast iron guarantee that all of the promises of God a yes and amen in Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus confirms his promises. It makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it, that Jesus is risen from the dead. And truth be told, it would take a bit of time for these three women to fully comprehend what it meant. It was too much for them in the early hours of that morning to take it all in. Mark tells us, and they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And yet what they'd heard that morning in those few words that the angel had said to them in that otherwise empty tomb indicated for them and for us and for all of the church the glorious implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That the resurrection of Jesus gives us peace, fuels our proclamation, guarantees our pardon, and confirms his promises 
to us. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, and all that this means for us. We thank you that he died for our sins, and on the third day he rose again, just as the Scriptures had foretold, and just as he himself had foretold. And as we consider these verses this evening, may we grasp more fully the significance of what the resurrection of Jesus means for us. Fill us with your peace, the peace that surpasses understanding, when we consider that in the risen Christ all of our sin is dealt with, and death has been defeated, so that we can be forgiven of our sin, reconciled to you, and enjoy eternal life with you. And then send us out into the world to share the news of the resurrection of Jesus with those who are still without Christ and without hope in this world. And we pray that even through our witness here, that we would see many people coming to put their trust in Jesus. We thank you that the risen Jesus is now in heaven at your right hand, where he intercedes for us. And when we've fallen into sin, even when we have fallen badly, may we look to Jesus and be assured of the forgiveness that is found in him. And fill us with confidence in every promise of your word confirmed to us by the fact of Christ's resurrection. Father, we pray that very soon he would return and bring to completion all of your saving purposes for your glory's sake. And in Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. We'll close our service by singing together uh, hymn number 229, which surely refers to those women that we've heard about in that passage from Mark 16. The Lord is risen indeed. Can this good news be true? Yes, those who saw the Saviour bleed have seen him risen too. Hymn number 229. We'll stand and sing together. close our service tonight remain standing and receive these words of benediction the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and the lord lift up his countenance upon you 
and give you peace. Amen.